everyone. My name, uh, my name is Arash Ashkar. I still can't hear you. Oh dear. Um, I'm I'm a cancer rehabilitation physician at Cedar Sinai, and over the years, um, I I really have developed a keen interest in so-called chemo brain type symptoms, and and we'll talk about them. One of the reasons, um, you know, I, I I've really uh, spent a lot of my time thinking about this and trying to develop strategies to contend with this. is because number one, as we'll talk about, they can be incredibly common. And I no longer believe that there's a quick medication fix that addresses the myriad of symptoms that we'll talk about. So we actually run a 10 week program to try to provide strategies to, um, to help optimize cognitive performance. I'm just gonna try to provide in, in the brief time that we have Um, just a, f a few high level strategies for your consideration that I hope will be productive in, in optimizing cognitive health. Um, I'll make sure to stop regardless of where I am about 10 minutes prior, just so we could have some discussion and, and we'll kind of keep um, hopefully have some fun as we're discussing um, this, this topic. So roadmap to cognitive health. And but by, by way of introduction again, These are very common symptoms. So if you look at the studies, maybe 70, 80% of folks experience some of these symptoms when they're in active treatment. And by that, I mean like the surgery, chemo, radiation, hormonal treatments, et cetera. And for 20 to 40% of people, they, they may linger for some time. And that's really what grabbed my attention and, and really... thinking about strategies to help because that's a lot of people that we're, we're talking about that I think need support to help with their recovery. And, and the symptoms really vary from person to person. And I don't have to tell you what they are because I, I imagine many of you experience some of these, but these would be things like short-term memory lapses, harder time with concentrating or short-term memory or, or having a harder time with multitasking So many people will say I used to, you know, keep an eye on my child and talk on the phone and, you know, you know, be able to cook a cook a, a dish all at the same time. And it was it was no sweat. Now I need to focus on just one thing or there's a word on the tip of my tongue and I just can't get that word out as quickly. So maybe any number, any any number of these symptoms. And the reality is, again, there is no clear definition. So it's not like you have to have a certain symptom and that qualifies you for so-called chemo brain. So there's no one size fits all, there's no single symptom. And the medical term actually is shifted from chemo brain, which I know is the term that's out there in the community to what we call CRCI or cancer related cognitive impairment. And I think it's important and I'm really gonna start here because it may not be that chemotherapy played the most important role for everyone. Some of you I imagine did not even have chemotherapy. And we see this in our clinic, right? Some people may have just had radiation or hormonal therapy um, and, and still may contend with the cognitive things that we were just alluding to. So one of my goals for this afternoon is really through, I, I know realize a kind of a busy slide, is to broaden our understanding of the myriad of factors that may contribute to CRCI or so-called chemo brain. So obviously, and I get this, we tend to focus on the cancer treatment, the chemo, the radiation, the surgery, and certainly that may play a role. But one of the challenges I think for all of us is to think about other factors at play. So I alluded to hormonal changes from, let's say in breast cancer, this may be like tamoxifen or Rimidex or for prostate cancer patients, some of the anti-testosterone um, drugs you know, side effects of the different medications we may have been on or other medical issues that we may be contending with. If I took a survey, we'll talk about this in a little bit. 
I'm willing to bet at least 50% of us are not sleeping well for a number of reasons. And I can assure you that contributes to CRCI. And while it's not the same thing, there's a lot of overlap between symptoms of anxiety and CRC, right? If it, and, and we all know, I mean, we've all experienced this. When we're worried, it's, it's really hard to think clearly. And so we have to think about how we're going to manage some of these concerns or chronic stress or poor nutrition. Or I'll talk a little bit about how lack of exercise or becoming deconditioned what, what does that have to do with our cognition? And you'll see one item bolded in yellow, and it's, it's bolded intentionally, and I want to spend a moment with this, because I imagine many of us have not necessarily heard of the word cytokines, but it's bolded because many scientists in this space believe that these cytokines play a significant role um, and if you don't mind maybe writing in the chat, anybody have any idea what cytokines are or what they do or even why they're so important? Um, I'm curious if anybody, I'm not sure if the chat feature is actually working right now, um, but any, any, any takers, and you can even unmute for a moment. What are cytokines and why are they so important? Oh, here's the chat. Here we go. Um, Yes, so somebody wrote that they are uh, uh, proteins. Um, but the question is, what do they do? Why are they important? Or why do so many people think they at least play a role in so-called uh, chemo brain symptoms? And, and what I'm about to talk about is I think is gonna give a context. So um, everyone in this room at some point has had the flu or a really bad cold, right? And, and just think about your own experience. When you had the flu, influenza, let's say, how did you feel? I'm willing to bet almost everyone felt extremely tired. Um, I imagine many of you feel kind of sad or blue for those few days. And I'm willing to bet virtually everyone does not want to take out a textbook and study for a midterm in the middle of the flu because... Right, we all feel kind of foggy and, and a little sluggish cognitively. But it turns out it's not the flu virus itself that makes you feel exhausted and sad and, and cognitively foggy. It's your immune system response to this virus. So your, vi so your body recognizes this, this foreign bug, right? And it says, okay, I'm gonna produce these cytokines in response that part of its role, and there's other roles for these things, and I, and I see this, people have commented this in the chat, that is gonna produce these inflammatory compounds to intentionally make you feel exhausted, sad, and blue, foggy. And of course, then the question is, well, why would your body wanna make you feel so terrible, right? So, so tired and foggy. And as you can imagine, if we believe this from an ancestral perspective, if we felt great with bundles of energy when we had the flu, we'd still be hunting buffalo and, and gathering nuts and berries and doing all the things that we did. It's only because we feel exhausted and foggy that we stay at home in bed in the cave and as Doreen just wrote, makes us sleep and rest. Right? It's only because we feel bad that we're we're kind of primed to rest. So those are those are those are what cytokines may be doing, at least in part. Now to bring this to the state of the science for so-called chemo brain, and I realize this is these are medical slides I'm showing you, but I, I think it's important to convey the topic. One theory is that when your immune cells either sees tumor cells or perceives and processes, let's say chemo, for example, it does what it was built to do, right? It sees something kind of foreign. And so it produces cytokines, just like it did with the flu. And as we talked about, these cytokines then, we believe at least in part, contributes to these cognitive symptoms, symptoms of fatigue, depression, et cetera. I hope that makes sense. 
And, and so again, what we're learning is, and I know this is another medical slide, I'll walk you through this. So this is an illustration of, an, of a, let's say our neurons, our brain cells. And, and this is on the bottom, the rest of our body. And, and what we know is that there is something called this blood brain barrier. So our brain has a barrier from, for the rest of our body which is important, this is important that we have this separation. And historically, let's say 10, 15 years ago, oncologists argued, you know, that there was really no such thing as chemo brain. And, and they had a point. And the reason for saying that was, their argument was chemotherapy drugs in, in general, and I'm being a little simplistic about this, do not cross this wall this barrier. They can't get through to the brain. So if they can't get through to the brain, why are we talking about something like chemo brain? It must be all just anxiety or some other kind of distress. And while they were right that the chemo drugs do not cross the blood brain barrier, this is a picture of our immune cells, the cytokines that I was just alluding to, these are these little purple circles in the illustration IL-1, IL-6, TNF-alpha, you don't have to worry about their names or what they are, but those purple dots in this illustration, which are the cytokines, guess what? They can cross the blood barrier. And we believe, again, at least in part, they are contributing to this whole chemo brain or CRCI phenomenon. Hope that makes sense. So then the question is, if we believe these cytokines are at least in part driving these chemo brain symptoms, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna reduce inflammation and protect our, our, our central nervous system and help with its recovery? And before I try to answer that question with the time that we have, I first wanna relate what I alluded to earlier. There is no pill that's gonna magically solve the symptoms that I was alluding to earlier. Now it's true on a case by case basis, I use or try to use some of these meds. You know, these are things like methylphenidate, modafinil, also known as Ritalin or Provigil. And there's some other drugs listed, but there's no great evidence that these drugs really work. So I'd rather, you know, suggest otherwise that we think about our roadmap to brain health and wellness more through strategies, through lifestyle ideas, that as we study this more and more, I really do believe, I wouldn't be here, right, spending my time and your valuable time talking about these ideas if I did not believe that they can help improve our cognitive health and brain health. And these are things like mindfulness strategies and exercise and sleep um, and, and cognitive strategies and things that I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about. Again, we only have a, a limited time today and we, we do run a program at Cedar sinai called Emerging from a Haze. That's a 10 week session where we take deeper dives to go through this in much more detail. Um, but I, I think it's just worth highlighting, out, highlighting a few strategies that you can start employing on your own and if it makes sense to participate in one of our programs we could we could talk about that during the q a as well okay so let's start with i'm a, again i mentioned i'm a rehab cancer rehab physician so exercise is is going to be top on my list on one of the things to do to help with crci or chemo brain symptoms now to introduce this concept in light of what we just discussed, I want to remind everyone that, and you, I know you all know this, but you know there's basically a bit being a bit simplistic. Two types of fat: there's so-called subcutaneous fat, which is underneath our skin, subcutaneous or right underneath the skin. This is like what we have in our arms and in our legs and 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 whatnot, and generically speaking, that's felt to be more or less harmless and benign and maybe even protective as we get older. 
Now, there's also another type of fat called visceral fat. Now, you've all heard of this idea of being apple-shaped or pear-shaped, right? I think many of us have heard this. And if they asked you, you know, which, which shape is felt to be more harmful to our health, you all know the, app, the answer is being apple-shaped. And why? We used to think that, or some people thought, that you know when it when the fat develops here in the kind of the belly, oh, it must be pushing on your liver or pushing on your pancreas, and just because of its geographical location, it must be kind of causing harm somehow. But that's not really the the reason why. And 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 it really turns out that the bad fat, the fat that we call visceral fat, that develops deeper in the abdomen. Guess what? It's not just hanging out taking up space, it's doing something, it's active. And what is it doing? It's producing inflammatory cytokines. We know, we know this to be the case. And that's why putting aside oncology or cancer uh, altogether for now, in the general population for all of us, moral visceral fat is associated because it's producing chronic inflammation, is associated with heart disease, diabetes, cognitive issues, again, putting aside the chemo brain phenomenon, certain cancers, higher mortality rates, et cetera, et cetera. And, and again, keep in mind, just looking at our weight on the scale isn't really a great way of looking at this because one may be normal weight and have a normal body mass index, and still have proportionally higher visceral fat. And there may be some of us who may be overweight based on the scale, but if you look at our body composition, what's going on inside, we have less visceral fat or bad fat. So just looking at the number on the scale is not the problem in isolation, in my estimation, the best way to go about this. So, let me give you just to hammer in this point, and I and I and I and I know this is a, I'm spending a lot of time on this, but I, this is so important. I want to illustrate it another way, and I and I'll, I'll walk you through these images because I know I'm showing you a bunch of medical slides. So there was this Scandinavian group that did this really interesting small study, but it was fascinating, and I'll walk you through this. They looked at healthy. I emphasize healthy and young college students in somewhere in Sweden or something who at baseline were active, which means they were walking 10,000 steps or a day or more. Okay. So the, and, and what they did is they wanted to say, well, how much visceral fat do these young adults have? So they put them in an MRI machine so you could very accurately measure the amount of fat you have in the abdomen and, and, and this is the before for one person. And, and again, the way these MRIs work is the feet are pointing out towards you. Don't worry about all the images and what they mean, but the white of the red arrow is showing, this is the liver over here, that's visceral fat. Okay, so they had, so they put everyone in the MRI machine, took their measurements, and then they asked them to go two weeks, 14 days, of being a couch potato, which means 1,500 steps a day or less. And after two weeks, guess what? Back in the MRI machine. And, and just listen to this. In just two weeks in healthy young adults, there was a 7% increase in abdominal fat, a 7% decrease in their VO2 max, which is their fitness level. This is one person that you see. So they went from this before you could see you see this white that that's showing up. That's visceral fat. Now I'm not trying to be hyperbolic, but this was in just two weeks in healthy young adults. What happens when we go through months of going from surgery to chemo to radiation to reconstructive surgery to I mean I don't have to tell you the 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 right, the, 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 the prolonged treatments that we go through. If well, a well-intentioned doctor said, 
which is what they did, what we did in the 80s and 70s, by the way, when you're going through chemo and even the 90s, I, I think, from what I've heard, the the guiding kind of motto was, you're, you know, you're, you're in treatment, just get some rest, just, you know, just stay in bed and conserve your energy. Don't move around too much. And we now know that that's scientifically broken and backwards, right? If all we do is lay in bed all day long, day after day after day, um, we know that there are body composition changes occurring. So what I'm here to suggest, at least in part, is exercise. It may not be the best way in isolation, at least, to lose weight, but I'm here to tell you that definitively it can reduce visceral fat, the bad fat. And in my mind, that's probably more important. So exercise will help us change our body composition, right? It can help reduce the bad type of fat from visceral fat. And, and exercise, I wouldn't be saying it if I didn't believe this to be true, truly is medicinal because it can reduce these inflammatory cytokines. So let me tell you one way it does that. Because if you're nerdy about the science at all, even just a little bit like I might be, let, let me tell you something fascinating. And and I, and I just want to make a, kind of put this into context of how our ancestry was wired. So when you walk, now let's take a step back. For the longest time, we, you know, scientists and physiologists, you know, viewed muscle as important for doing something basic, which is what we always assume muscle is important so we can lift things, we can move our bodies, right? So I can move a table, so I can pick up a rock and throw a rock. You know, that was the role of muscle in our mind for, for millennia, right? That, that it just serves a mechanical function. And again, as always, uh, things are much more, more complicated than, than we understood. So now we're learning that when you walk, when you swim, when you do a squat, when you do a curl, and you contract your muscle, it turns out that your muscle also produces something. This is a picture of a muscle fiber. And this thing that we didn't know about until 10, 15 years ago, really, that muscle produces have been dubbed myokines because they kind of behave and, and look like cytokines, but I'm being far too simplistic about this. What do these myokines do? At least in part, they reduce the cytokines. Now, let me tell you why I think this is so incredibly elegant. If we believe in some you know, whether you believe in evolution or a master designer or both, I'm not here to question what anyone believes, but let me tell you whatever you believe, how incredibly elegant this is. Now let's go back to our ancestor that I talked about. So let's say 100,000 years ago, I had a really bad infection, I had a, a bad flu, okay? And remember, there were no antibiotics, there were no antiviral drugs, there were no ICUs. So what happened is we I had a bad flu. To protect myself, my body, I already said, produced these inflammatory cytokines, which made us feel, we said made us feel exhausted, tired, right, foggy, maybe a little depressed, which then compelled me to stay at home in the cave to rest. And you rest for a few days. And hopefully a different part of your immune system is kind of dealing with the virus. And as the viral burden hopefully went down and I started to feel a bit better, what would I, if, I, if you were that ancestor, what would you then go on to do after two, three, four days after hopefully contending with this virus? What would we go back to doing? Now, I hope you agree that if I was going to survive, right? I would go back to hunting, right? I'd go back to gathering nuts and berries because otherwise I wouldn't be able to eat, right? So you, you couldn't go just walk to the refrigerator. You had to go back to hunting, which means you were contracting your muscles, which means 
you were contracting your muscles, which was producing these myokines, and then the myokines were reducing the cytokines that were just produced to protect me. So for millions of years, we had the system where if we had an infection or an injury, inflammation would go up. And then hopefully if we survived, after a few days, we start contracting our muscles again, it would produce myokines, and then inflammation would go down. Now, this system that we relied upon for, again, a million years has virtually been obliterated over the last generation. Because let's say I get a cold or a flu tomorrow, or COVID, let's say, right? Um, you know, I'm, I may stay home from work for a couple of days, but after I start feeling better, I go back to work, which means I sit behind a computer all day. So inflammation went up in response to the virus I had, but it doesn't fully come down to the levels that we want because the system that we had to keep things in check, again, for a million years has virtually been obliterated. Now, if we believe this theory that exercise can reduce inflammation and improve our cognition, I mean, I, th I think it's important to put that to the test. And this, this was just one of many studies showing that, um, so this is a study where they had a group of adults who were couch potatoes. They put them, these adults through cognitive testing, looking at what's called executive function and reaction time and, 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 and other cognitive domains. I'm not gonna sp spell that all out right now. Um, but what they did is after they completed their cognitive testing with neuropsych testing, they had half the group exercise for six months aerobically and the other half, they just stretched. So that was the control group. The red was the exercise group, the blue was the st uh, stretching control group. And you could see in virtually every cognitive domain, you know, again, these weren't brain exercises it was aerobic exercise that improved cognitive symptoms. And, and again, if you look at every major national guideline in the cancer space, American Cancer Society, NCCN, American College of Sports Medicine, on and on, they will say that we should get 150 minutes of moderate aerobic exercise or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise and doing so reduces the chance of all cause mortality anywhere from 30 to 50%, which is not a negligible number. And so why does exercise improve survival from let's say breast cancer or colon cancer or prostate cancer? And one of the theories behind that is again, what we're alluding to that chronic inflammation at least for some cancer types, maybe driving recurrence rates or progression. And again, as we talked about, I hope it made the case, exercise can reduce inflammation. So lowering that inflammatory pathway is good for our brain and good for fighting cancer itself. I'm not saying it's a magic bullet and it cures everything, but I also am saying that 30 to 50% is not a number to laugh about, you know, and, and to take lightly. Okay, so I hope I made the case. Strategy number one is to try to get 150 minutes of moderate aerobic exercise. And I'm not going to talk about it much today, but you, I really would recommend strength training twice a week as well. And I would talk to your own doctor about how that could be safe for your situation. Now, before I go on, let me pause for a second on this because you could see it says 150 minutes of moderate aerobic or 75 minutes of vigorous. What does that mean practically for you or for me or for Mrs. Jones? Wait, what, what, is, what is moderate? We throw these terms around, right? What does moderate mean? Because I could tell you, if you take an Olympic athlete, you know, I'm just making up numbers, jogging at four miles an hour may be very light, not even moderate for an Olympic athlete. And for Mrs. Jones, it could be extremely intense. So just saying do one type of exercise does not make it moderate or light or vigorous. 
And the easiest way, this is like, like a little tip I just want to share to figure out what is moderate for me today, right? Whether I had a bone marrow transplant or chemo for breast cancer or whatever it may be, what is moderate for me in a way that I can work with? And there's a very simple trick. It's called the sing talk test. And this is, you've probably heard it, but this is how it works. Let's say you're going to choose walking or a stationary bike or whatever, whatever really works for elliptical, right? Roman, whatever you want. If I can sing, let's say, happy birthday the entire time, um, let's say riding my bike, that means it's too light. That means I have room to take it up a notch. Now, if I can't talk in a short sentence because I'm, you know, huffing and puffing, then, you know, that's really considered vigorous. So to figure out what is moderate in a practical way, if you can find a pace where you can talk, at least in a short sentence, but not sing, then, you know, that's a reasonable assessment of being in the moderate zone. And that, that's, that's basically known as the sing-talk test. Okay. Theme number two, and I realize um, I'm, I may have to you know, start, you know, stop after theme number two, but I think even these two ideas um, will be helpful, I hope, I hope. So let's talk about sleep. And again, let's put, let's start with the context outside of cancer because it's important for us as a society. We know, now when I was in high school and college, right, the emphasis was always on, you know, don't drink and drive, right? Because you're going to kill someone, you're going to kill yourself, you're going to kill um, you know, innocent people, which is, of course, of course, that's important. But there was really no emphasis on don't be sleep deprived and drive. And we know that that may be just as risky, if not more. And this graph so it shows this. If you sleep less than four hours, you're almost 12 times as likely to get in a car accident, even getting five or six hours, which is what, right, many people get, you're almost two times as likely to get uh, into a car accident. And, and we know now, and I'm not going to spend much time on this, but, you know, we, our brain develops these like neurotoxins, um, because of our activity. And one of the ways we clear out these neurotoxins is, is, is with a system called the lymphatic system of the brain, which is also known as the glymphatic system. Well, guess what? This glymphatic system of the brain that clears out the neurotoxins, it works most efficiently when we're sleeping, not when we're awake. That's why, again, many neuroscientists are saying how important it is to get enough sleep so we can clear out these neurotoxins. Now, when we talk about chemo brain symptoms and sleep, what one of the ideas that I, I want to impress upon you is this is from a study from a couple of years ago, that there seems to be a rather clear correlation between how much either quality or quantity of sleep we're getting and the severity of our chemo brain symptoms. So what you could see is, for example, if you have no sleep issues you know, on the left, you know, the likelihood of having like cognitive symptoms is 20%. But if you have mild sleep issues, it goes up to 43%. If you have moderate sleep issues, it goes up to 60%. If you have severe sleep issues, it goes up to almost 72%. So maybe they kind of go together. They're kind of um, kind of doing this dance together. I believe it's actually causative, at least in part. So if you believe this graph, then I'm here to suggest that we, if you're not sleeping well, one of the strategies that we have to think about is how are we going to optimize good sleep so that our brains can heal and work as optimally as they can. Now, I'm not here to talk about drugs today because that's something you should talk to about with your own physicians. They all have their caveats. And, and again, I, 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 my personal view is that whenever possible, it's not always possible, we should try to manage sleep disturbances without meds. So I'm, I'm just here to talk about some non-medication strategies to create optimal sleep and, and optimal circadian rhythm. Circadian rhythm refers to our clocks, our internal clocks, which in many ways relates to sleep. 
So one low hanging fruit that I think we forget about to optimize our clock, which is really a, a big part of optimizing sleep is trying to get some natural light during the day coupled with darkness at night. And I know this sounds very basic and rudimentary, but again, I think we're often overlooking the basic things. And this is this is really important in if we if we want to um, again optimize our clock. And again, so number one, most of us don't spend any time outside. I used to think that if I sit by a window, that's enough, and that really doesn't that in terms of circadian rhythm, that really doesn't do it because uh, that wavelength of light gets blocked by the even windows. And the other thing I learned not too long ago is when we wear sunglasses outside, that also blocks the wavelength of light that goes through our eyes that regulates our clock. Now, again, if you need sunglasses for eye health reasons because of what the recommendation that we made by your eye doctor, I'm, I'm not going to interfere with that. But I do think it's helpful to get some natural light. You can wear a hat still because light bends through our eyes, because it's our eyes that regulates our clock. If you're thinking about vitamin D, that's our skin, but I'm, I'm more interested in our clock right now. And the other side of the formula is we're exposed to far too much artificial light at night with the LEDs, iPhones, you know, iPads, and, and all the bright lights that are around us. And until you've gone to you know, Joshua Tree or Death Valley or something, I think most of us forget how dark the night sky that we ancestrally evolved to live with truly was. So one strategy is to try to get some natural light, I would say 30 to minutes or an hour a day if you can, and try to guard our eyes and block all this artificial light as best as you can at night. And this is so important in my mind. There was a recent study from just this last year that showed that if you had the most um, light exposure at night when you don't want it, you're at 30% higher risk for depression, 20% higher risk for anxiety, 20% higher risk of psychosis, right? These are not negligible numbers. And if you had the most light exposure during the day when you want it, you had 20% lower risk of depression and self-harm, 30% lower risk of PTSD. So again, that's another way of, I think, emphasizing this point. That it's, it's important to regulate our, our light environment. The second idea that I want to talk about that I think is at play for many of us when we go through something stressful. And believe me, I'm not discounting this. I know going through all this with our scans and biopsies and waiting for test results, and I don't have to tell you all this. That, that's that These are stressful times, at least sometimes, and it, and it creates worries. Uh, right? For a human, we're going to experience this uh, during these kind of situations. The challenge is when, when we have stress and worries, the normal human response is to not sleep well because I'm thinking about stuff. And when we're not sleeping well, we get frustrated because we're tossing and turning in bed and we want to sleep, but we can't sleep because, right? Because of the worries we talked about. It's not that we don't want to sleep, but, but it's just hard to fall asleep. So we're tossing and turning. We're frustrated. This may be go on for a while, and if this goes on for a few weeks, for example, which it often can, then when we just think about going to sleep the next night, we still, the, the same feelings of frustrations and negative feelings may come up because we remembered what happened last night and the night before and the night before that. And just the thought of that brings up those kind of negative feelings. And guess what? These frustrations and negative feelings it actually makes us have worse sleep. And then that leads us, when we're not sleeping well, to have more stress and more worries. So I believe that this pattern that I'm describing it drives many of our sleep issues. Not always, but at least oftentimes. And if you think that this pattern may be at play, 
in your own individual circumstance, one, one strategy to help break this pattern that can work, it does take discipline, is called stimulus control therapy. And I'm gonna describe briefly how it works and, and then um, I'll probably stop for any questions and answers because I realize I can go on for hours and hours and, and, and unfortunately I do have a one o'clock meeting. So um, I would only do this stimulus control therapy if you think you're in that pattern that I just described, right? If you're, right, so if you're, if you're, if this is at play with this negative kind of pattern, then it might be worth considering um, this. And I wouldn't necessarily do this if you're in the middle of active, let's say chemotherapy. And, you know, I, I would probably wait until there's a more stable situation. So this is how stimulus control works. So number one, you see the picture of that bedroom. And I only say this partially tongue in cheek, you kind of want to make your bedroom look like that. What is it? What is it about the bedroom? There's no to do list. There's no work piles. It's not a chaotic mess. You want to try to create a new environment that lends itself to the sleep um, process. And and again, a nice inviting bedroom is one part of that. So as best as you can, um, let's clean up our room and make the bedroom inviting. Rule next rule: you only go to bed when you're sleepy, right? So let's say it's 10.45, 10 o'clock, you're starting to feel sleepy, you go to the bed and you do not watch TV, read, eat or worry in bed. You only use the bed for sex or sleep. That's an important rule. And if you can't fall asleep, this is the hard part. And I empathize that this is hard, but if you cannot fall asleep within 20 minutes or 15 minutes, the rule is you have to get yourself out of bed and go to the kitchen and stay there. You meditate, you pray, you listen to some relaxing music. You don't do something productive like pay your bills or, or answer emails or, or do something that rewards you in some way. You just kind of hang out and relax until you feel like you can go to bed, go back to bed and fall asleep. And when you do feel like you can go back to sleep, you go back to the bedroom. And again, if you don't fall asleep within 20 minutes, you go back out to the kitchen and and, you, and, this, and this pattern carries on. So let's say I finally got to bed at 2 a.m. The rule is also you have to set an alarm for your desired wake up time. Let's say it's 7 a.m. And you don't take a nap the next day. So that's just, this is where it gets hard, right? So you wake up at a set time, including during the weekend, you don't take a nap the next day. And so why might this work to break that pattern that we were talking about earlier? And, and one reason why this works is, let's say I got to bed at two or three in the morning and I woke up at seven. I can't take a nap the next day because I'm not allowed to. One reason it works is the next evening when it gets to be 10 o'clock, I'll have a lot more sleep inertia, right? I slept so little, right, uh, the previous night because I was out, out in the kitchen that there's a lot more sleep inertia to get me to fall asleep and stay asleep the next night. But there's, a, I think, a more interesting psychological explanation. What happens to many of us when we've gone through a period of time where we've had worries and, and anxieties and whatnot is when we go to bed and we think about our worries, subconsciously you're associating the bed with the what ifs and the thinking and the worrying. It becomes linked. So your head, your head hits the pillow and those thoughts come up immediately. And what this technique is doing is it's taking those worries now to the kitchen. The bed, when your bed, bed hits the pillow, it's just sleep. The worries are now associated with some other part of the house. And that's the other reason psychologically it may help break the pattern. So this technique called stimulus control therapy is part of a larger program called 
CBT for insomnia or cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And any good sleep expert worth their salt will tell you this should be the thing that we try first for chronic insomnia. All recent guidelines are, are endorsing this idea. It's not just me. And I'm not going to go over all of it. It's usually five to seven sessions. It includes stimulus control, relaxation, sleep hygiene. It includes something called cognitive restructuring, which I'm not going to talk about because there's not enough time, but um, that, that, that helps you re-examine your relationship with how you view sleep. And historically, you had to find the therapist that was trained. And it's, again, usually five to eight sessions. But now I will also tell you there are online programs that are relatively inexpensive that you can do um, kind of on your own at your own pace. So I would recommend if you feel like you're, you know, you're having a hard time with chronic insomnia to consider CBT insomnia, but there's a whole host of other strategies, acupuncture, and many of these are available right at your cancer support community, right? There's, and this is why I think they're important. And you have to find what works for us you know, yoga or music therapy or mindfulness meditation or hypnosis or spending time in nature or prayer or any number of strategies. But the key ideas, in addition to these integrative ideas that I, this is just the summary point for sleep is number one, it's important to stick to a schedule, including weekends, especially when you're done with your active treatment I think this is overlooked. I would really be careful about avoiding caffeine in the afternoon because we often forget that it takes a while to wear out of your system. And it may be one of those you know, things we overlook that, be, that could be contributing to insomnia. Now, I know alcohol can help some of us fall asleep, but the quality of sleep is not ideal with alcohol. It reduces something called REM sleep which really helps us feel cognitively restored. So I would avoid alcohol before bedtime. Don't take a nap after 3 p.m. Before that might be okay for many people, but I would not do it after three. A hot bath before bedtime actually I think is helpful. One, it helps you relax. But two, when you get in a hot bath, because your skin and subcutaneous tissue gets so hot, your core temperature has to cool down to compensate. And when your core cools down, that sends a message to your brain, it's time for sleep and it helps you sleep. For the same reason, keeping your temperature of your bedroom on the cooler side. I know it's hot right now. It's hard to do that right now with our heat wave and everything, but most sleep experts will tell you that about 65, Anywhere from 63 to 67 is a more ideal temperature for, you know, manufacturing better sleep. And for all the reasons we just talked about a moment ago, and I know this one's hard, you don't want to lie in bed awake for more than 20 minutes. Why? Because when we do that, that's when we have these negative associations subconsciously between our brain's and and the bed and and you want to try to avoid that that association so um if there the two strategies that i only had time to kind of leave you with for today that i really do believe can help with cognitive health after going through cancer treatment is exercise for the reasons that we talked about and try to optimize um, your sleep again there's many other ideas that I really think can make a difference. Um, unfortunately, I, I just don't have the time to share all of it right now. I will, I will say, um, so again, this is an overview of our 10 week program. And again, sometimes when there's space, we, we allow people outside of Senior Sinai um, to enroll. Um, we're, in, we're kind of wrapping up a program now, but we'll, we should have another one in a few months. So I, I want to you know kind of offer that to you all collectively as a group. You could you could reach out to me if you think you might be interested. Uh, and I also wanted to make one other kind of um, advertisement. We are actually about to open a study 
for, for so-called chemo brain symptoms that is utilizing light therapy. It's this helmet that um, produces a photobiomodulation, which is a wavelength of light. To, it's a pilot study to see if it can help with these chemo brain type symptoms. As you could see, to be eligible, you have to have um, one of these cancer types that I listed. Um, you have to have completed treatment at least six months ago, but not more than five years ago. And, and again, there's some other criteria uh, that, that's required for this study. This is kind of a graphic of, of what this helmet looks like, but it's much more mundane. That, that's, this is the real life version of the helmet. So people who qualify for the study, they would come into our clinic twice a week for six weeks. And since it is a, a, a clinical trial, there's a 50% chance, even if you enroll, that you would get the fake light. So there's going to be the real light that comes out of the helmet or the fake light. And you and I both wouldn't know which group you got randomized to. So there are all these limitations when there are studies. Not everyone qualifies. Even if you did qualify, it doesn't mean you got the, the, the therapeutic light. Because we don't know if this is effective. And the only way we'll know is to put this through um, a, clinical, a clinical trial. So if you're interested in either the clinical educational program, feel free to contact me. Or if you're interested in the clinical trial that should open probably in a month, um, feel free to contact me. You could see I have my email and my phone number there.